Good morning, everybody. So we are moving ahead with semester three. In semester three project-based course, one of your very important components is what we are going to be starting with in this entire one week. So before we uh, get into it, I want you to observe the picture that I'll be sharing on my screen right now. There are two pictures that you'll be seeing on the screen. I want you to find what is the difference in picture number A and picture number B. Well, as you can see in picture number A, I am sure you might have spotted that picture number A shows it's very, very flat. It's something which is very, very structured, which is very systematic planning. However, in picture B, we can see that the planning is very, very haphazard. We see that houses have mushroomed wherever probably there was space available, right? So we see a lot of intricate planning that has gone about in picture A and it is not evident in picture B. So do you think planning is a part of only one profession? Well, obviously the answer is that planning is a part of any profession, right? So now let's understand, look at this picture. Here we see that there is school X, which has yielded 100% results. This school is one which has the state of art facilities. It has the most uh, efficient of teachers. It has a good infrastructure. It has probably a very good curriculum. Right? And as a result of which, this school has full admission. And it has also ensured to get 100% results. However, the same cannot be said about Y school, which again has the best of facilities, the best infrastructure, the best uh, uh, features, who are very, very efficient. Uh, but however, this Y school did not get 100% results. Can you plan or can you identify what could be the reason? Both schools have the same facilities, both schools have the same teachers, both schools uh, have the same methodology of teaching, but still somewhere, why school that? It could be quite possible that when you have the best of teachers, you have the best of curriculum, you have the best of facilities, you have the best of equipments to teach, but you are not able to get the result that you desire to achieve. It could be the lack of planning on the part of the school, wherein they are not able to effectively utilize all those material and human resources that are available to them. And thus we say that without planning, no nation can move ahead. And so the same is true even about schools. No school administration will be successful without effective planning. And thus planning is very, very essential. It is the backbone of school administration. Now, when we are talking about planning, planning is something which is very, very important, right? So here we are going to restrict planning solely towards the teaching learning process that is implemented by the teacher in the classroom. Now, when I say, for instance, that an ex-teacher's teaching methodology is far much more effective in comparison to the Y teacher's teaching methodology. Now, what makes me compare that an X teacher is more effective than a Y teacher? Well, it could be, uh, I'm so sorry for the bit, but so what makes me say that an X teaching methodology is much more effective than a Y teacher. Well, it is quite possible that the teaching methodology we say is more effective because he or she, that is the ex teacher, is teaching more effectively. She is good at teaching. But then what constitutes good teaching? How can I say that she is teaching better than the Y teacher? Well, the parameters on which we judge a teaching to be good is that the teacher probably has an objective, right? So the, at the end of when she has taught a particular lesson, she has achieved the objectives that she had laid down. 
also we see that the content in her hand what is the content she is teaching and whether the methodology that she implemented to teach her content was effective or not we also say that the teacher is teaching more effectively in terms of the evaluation strategies that she adopts right so this is what constitutes good teaching she plans the content effectively she ensures that the objectives are fulfilled she uses the right teaching methodology and she also has an effective evaluation technique in place and that is what that uh, is what which helps us say that a teacher is much more effective so this goes without saying that good teaching is not something that happens within the four walls of the classroom only good teaching is a process it's a long process it is not something that happens out of the blue it requires a lot of details and intricate planning on the part of the teacher or the various components which we saw a teacher looks at the content she develops the objectives she identifies what are her objectives that she wants to achieve what are the teaching strategies that she wants to achieve how will she develop the content and the evaluation strategies so this all all these components that she looks towards she works towards are nothing but they are all related in a very very meaningful way so now this is when you uh, go to schools and you are hired as a teacher over there the first and foremost task that will be given to you will be that you will have to plan your subject for one entire year and that is what we term as a year plan okay and this is what we are going to look into in our today's class and that is nothing but your plan so while planning a teacher must keep the following points in mind she has to ensure she has to understand what are the units that she is going to teach what are the objectives that she will achieve also how many number of teaching periods would she require in a particular year to teach all those uh, units that she has in front of you uh, in front of her and how many numbers of testing period would she require for the units that she has taught and this together is called as your year plan so the teacher is expected to recognize the content which is there in the textbook of her subject matter she clumps them into suitable units and this is necessary when the matter is not systematically arranged in the textbook so some of the textbooks you will find that the matter that the content is already put into units but in some of the textbooks the chapters are very haphazardly arranged so first she will have to take those chapters put them into specific units and then devise the entire plan of the year now we will look at that in detail so let's move ahead and now the most important step is that yes you are supposed to prepare a year plan but before we move on towards understanding how to prepare a year plan first and foremost you need to understand this the number of teaching days that you will have to teach a particular subject in the entire year so that's very very important now you need to answer and try to tell me how many uh, days are there in a year obviously there are 365 days in a year right but out of those 365 days how many teaching days do you have in your hand do you teach for all 365 days in a year obviously no there are vacations that come there are days when you are supposed to take exams there are Any public holidays that come, there are Saturdays and Sundays also that come. So, from those three sixty-five days, 
for how many exact days do you have the students with you such that you can teach them and also test them now that calculation is very very important i have shared a worksheet with you all right and i asked you to either copy it down in your notebook or take a pen so you can remove that period calculation worksheet and you can calculate with me as i proceed now let's look at this this is how your worksheet looks like right when i'm talking about school teaching we start teaching in a particular class from the month of june and this teaching goes up to the end of march so let us start calculating one by one so if you see in the month of june we have total of two teaching weeks why do i say two teaching weeks because we join we in any ssc medium school the school starts from the third week that is 14 june onwards school starts right so we will take two teaching periods over sorry two teaching weeks over there testing we do not test right so we will not have any testing periods written over there and vacations we have two vacations which is right in the beginning which is the extension of may vacation. we have in all four saturday sundays i'm not counting the vacations of because the saturday sunday uh, that comes under vacation but under teaching weeks we get four saturday sundays together okay so that is counted as four next we move on to july in july we teach for four weeks right so we just have simple four there are no testing periods and there are no vacations in august again we have three teaching periods right and we have one testing period Accordingly, we also calculate our holidays. So we have eight Saturday Sundays, three teaching periods plus one testing period, out of which five days I am teaching and four days, uh, uh, five days I teach in a week and two days I have holiday. That is Saturday Sunday. So four multiply by uh, two Saturday Sunday is equal to total eight Saturday Sundays. We also have two public holidays in the month of August. So which are those two public holidays? We have Independence Day and we have Parsi New Year. Again, we move on to September. Now, in September again, we have approximately three uh, teaching uh, weeks, okay, and we have one vacation, which is that vacation that we get now in the month of September. That is Ganpati vacation. Accordingly, I also calculate my holidays in the month of October. Now, here I have two testing periods. Uh, sorry, two teaching periods. I have one testing period, which is my term exam. And I also have my Diwali vacation. That is one week. So two teaching weeks, one testing week, and one vacation. November, we start off with vacation. So this November we have uh, another one week of vacation. Okay, and then we have three teaching weeks. Okay, in the month of December again we have three teaching weeks and one vacation. In the month of Jan. Three teaching weeks are always there, and one testing week. That is your unit exam, which comes in the month of Jan. Jan. In Feb, we are teaching for all four weeks. In the month of Feb, we are uh, teaching for all four weeks. In the month of March, we are again teaching for four weeks. And finally, in the month of April, we have two weeks of uh, testing, and we have two weeks of vacation. May we have nothing. So if you calculate like this, you will identify the total of all in the month of from June to April. We have seventy-two Saturday Sundays, and we have thirty public holidays. So in all, we have eighty-five days holiday from those three sixty-five days. Let's move ahead and look at this. This is how we have calculated. We just discussed uh, just two minutes back. So now, if you count all these number of weeks over here, if you count two, four, three, three, all these teaching weeks, so they come up to thirty-one weeks. Here, testing weeks total, we have five testing weeks. Vacations, we have twelve weeks as vacation. So if you count, thirty-one weeks is equal to one fifty-five days. How do I get those one fifty-five days? Well, we will see now. The total number of teaching weeks. How many teaching weeks do we have? So we calculated thirty-one weeks. 
and there are five days of teaching in a week. So thirty one multiplied by five up works up to one fifty five days. How many total testing weeks do we have? So we just calculated we had five testing weeks, right? So five weeks of testing multiplied by five days it comes up to twenty five days of testing. So in short, total number of school days that we have are nothing but teaching days plus testing days is equal to the total number of school days that you have in hand. So it works up to one fifty five days of teaching plus twenty five days of testing is equal to total one eighty total school days that you have. Now this is excluding of your Saturday and Sunday. Okay. So there are total thirty six weeks that you are teaching in school, out of which you are only teaching five days in a week. You are not teaching on Saturdays and Sundays, and that is what has been removed from you. So do not multiply it by seven. You are supposed to multiply by multiply it by five. So how many total days are there in a year? Obviously, it's three sixty five. So let us see. We are getting this calculation of three sixty five. So we have one eighty days total. That's one fifty five teaching. That's twenty five testing is equal to one eighty. Out of that, we have a total of eighty four days as vacations that you will that we get. Then we get public holidays as well. Public holidays and Saturdays and Sundays. That is total eighty five. So if I just go back and show you this slide, you will see one fifty five plus twenty five is one eighty. One eighty plus eighty four plus eighty five works up to Around three forty nine. Thus, children, we are missing out on sixteen days over here. And where are those sixteen days gone? So, if you go back to the um, table just one slide before, you will identify that I have not counted the Saturdays and Sundays. There are four Saturdays and Sundays that I have not counted in the month of June and April. And eight Saturday Sundays, which are not counted in May, right? So here, yeah, May, I have not counted any Saturdays and Sundays over here, right? Even if you see the vacations, I have multiplied it by so here I have not calculated the Saturdays and Sundays. Four Saturday Sundays I have written over here. Four are still missing. And over here in the month of June again, uh, there are four Saturday Sundays that are missing. So four over here plus four over here plus eight over here. So that is how those sixteen are not there. So if you see over here, it is three sixty-five days. Now after having understood as to how many total teaching days and testing days do you have. And that you have understood the total number of days you have with the students in the school in one week, we can now start planning our year plan. So the most important, the first step towards preparing your year plan is that the teacher has to first look into the formation of units. Now, what are you going to do, and how are you going to find and look into the formation of units? The first and important, most important step uh, step here is that you, as a teacher, has to look into the textbook. And identify the subject matter that is there, and then collapse that subject matter into suitable units. Now, this step is only important if the content or the chapters in your textbooks are already not systematically organized. If they are systematically organized, then there is no problem. But quite a number of times, there are certain uh, subjects wherein the content matter is just put haphazardly. The chapters are put in a very haphazard manner, right? So we need to first organize them into suitable units. So first, let's understand what is a unit. A unit is nothing but it is a large subdivision. It is a logical and psychological subdivision of the chapters that are there in your hand. Now, for example, there could be a unit which is titled as humor. So all chapters in your English textbook in standard uh, six probably all those chapters which come under humor can be clubbed together put under that particular unit. 
So there could be humorous, there could be a prose lesson. For example, Nasruddin knows better. There could be a poem which could be quite humorous. For example, uh, Mr. Mobadi. So there are certain content which could be related to humor. Those chapters you can put under a particular unit and give it the give the unit name as humor. So what then is a unit? It is nothing but it is a principle, topic, central idea, or property wherein all chapters related to that idea or that principle are clubbed together. So all similar type of content are put in the one particular unit. So there are many uh, examples of uh, units that you can have. So for example, under English, you can have units like histor historical chapters. So chapters like King Arthur can come under, uh, uh, under this unit of historical information. You can have a poem like, for example, O Captain, My Captain. So all chapters related to history, poems related to history can also come over here. I can also have a composition that could be a part of historical or the unit history. So for example, I can ask them to write an autobiography about any king, for instance. Okay, so that is one uh, example of a unit in English. You can also have nature as a unit. So, for example, there is this poem, uh, Race of Class, that can come under nature. There is a chapter named, called as Revati's Magical Plants, that can come over here. There is another chapter called as Medicinal Plants, that can also come under nature. right? And there could be some uh, letter writing or composition that we can have, ask the students, uh, make them understand those components of the letter writing or autobiography and put it under the unit titled as nature. Another uh, unit name could be humor, it could be entertainment. Another one could be values, so all chapters related to values can come over here. Another unit under English could be environment and hygiene, so that can come over here. In history, you have different units. For example, you can have Mughals as a unit name, you can have India's uh, freedom struggle, you can have uh, India's struggle to uh, freedom before uh, 1900, you can have India's freedom struggle between 1900 to 1950, right? So that is one uh, way of dividing your chapters into various units. Mostly in history, the chapters are already systematically arranged, okay? So these are some examples of units that you can have under history. Under science, the unit names could be, uh, your chapters could be divided into all chapters related to light can come together, chapters related to magnetism can come together, all chapters related to health can come together, chapters related to the universe can come together. Right? So that is also one example of as to how you can have units in science. Now the second dimension of your year plan is nothing but the you as a teacher has to first identify which are the short-term objectives and which are the long-term objectives. Now, which are the short-term objectives that you achieve in your classroom? And what are short-term objectives? Well, short-term objectives are all those objectives that you will achieve within the 30 minutes of your class. So this could be remembering, understanding, you could also have uh, apply because you make the child apply the knowledge that they have learned in that 30 minutes class. You also ask them to create something. They make their, uh, they give their own examples. So they uh, write their own essay or by themselves. You just teach them the rules of writing a letter. Now they create something new out of it, right? So that is, these are certain uh, short term objectives that you can achieve in your 30 minute class. So you have memory understanding, you have applied, you have evaluate, and you have created which are certain short-term objectives. Now, apart from these, there are certain long-term objectives. Now, these long-term objectives may be achieved in that 30-minute class, but it's maybe. However, most number of times we've seen that these objectives take more than a week to develop. For instance, if you want to develop in them 
appreciation towards the use of figures of speech. You cannot achieve it by just making them understand the meaning of figures of speech or just by teaching them simile. They will not see the importance of the use of figures of speech while expressing oneself. But slowly, as you proceed with figures of speech, you see them similes, metaphors, personification, hyperblades, uh, uh, what are the other ones? Alliteration, tautology, fun. When you teach them all this and they start applying it, will they realize the beauty of using a figures of speech? They will appreciate the use of this literary device. Right? So it does not take, it is, it cannot be achieved in 30 minutes class. So that is why we say there are certain long-term objectives. They might develop interest, but this interest in figures of speech may be very momentary because they like personification and they have understood the examples so well and they can relate to it, thus they find it very, very interesting. However, tautology or euphemism may not be uh, as simple to grasp and they might lose interest, right? But as a whole, after they have learned all the figures of speech, they develop in-depth interest in the use of figures of speech. So these are long-term objectives which take a lot of time to develop. So which are the long-term objectives then? Definitely interest appreciation, developing of scientific attitude, the scientific temper, developing of positive attitude. So these are some long-term objectives which may be achieved in 30 minutes, but generally it takes a large amount of time. You need to really be with the students and talk to them and show them the beauty of uh, the particular concept or chapter that we're teaching. And that is how the long-term objectives are achieved. So in short, you as teachers need to now in the second dimension of the, your plan, you need to be able to identify which are the objectives which you will be able to achieve when you are teaching a particular unit. So when I am teaching this unit called nature, and in nature I have a chapter with medicinal plants, I am teaching them an autobiography or, or, or how to write an autobiography of a plant. I am also teaching them uh, a prose lesson that is uh, rare piece musical plan. I also have poem, like for example, the race of class, right? So when I have these many lessons, uh, these many chapters that I am teaching them or these many topics that I'm teaching them, which are the objectives that I will be able to achieve when I am teaching this particular unit? So the objectives that I need to achieve will be recall but more than recall i know that comprehension will be of a greater value so i would probably say that more than recall because recall they might just remember the names they might just remember the story they might just remember the name of the poet or the author right but comprehension because they understand they will read the chapter and they are able to give answers in their own way they are able to identify the meaning of words so there's a definitely a lot of comprehension. There is also apply because when I'm teaching them the rules of writing or uh, the uh, process of writing autobiography, they understand it and now they apply it in a new situation. They create a new autobiography. They write an autobiography by themselves and they definitely create it, right? They probably find out more information about uh, medicinal plants. So here also they are doing something more. They are uh, creating something. They're creating a workbook probably, if you ask me. So these are certain objectives that you know will really develop. In, in comparison to recall, these might have an upper hand. Again, comprehension definitely will have more impetus. Create maybe a little less and recall maybe much lesser. Right? So that is how I identify. And then accordingly, I can give weightage to the objectives that I achieve. Okay, so let's look at this example. This this is serial number four. The name of the unit over here is sum, and I am very sure the month in which I am teaching is the month of Jan. So, which are the chapters which are related to this particular unit that I have identified? So, under sound, I am going to teach them the chapter sound and production of sound, 
have a given pro uh, propagation of sound and I will give an electric charge. Now, when I am teaching this, here I know that there will be a lot of remembering. So, the student over here has given A to that particular objective. Understanding is B. There is nothing to apply. So, he or she has given E. There is nothing at all when it comes down to analyze. There is no grade there. Evaluate, probably B. Create, they are making something as home assignment, probably. So, then B is given over here. Skill development, C. Positive attitude, B. Appreciation, E. And interest is E. So, in short, when you are objective, uh, when you are trying to identify the objectives, a competent teacher is one who should be able to pinpoint and say which objectives can be achieved to what level. Now, if you see over here, the person who has created this has given grades to the entire unit. He or she is saying, not talking about only one particular chapter, but he or she is talking about the entire unit and what objectives can be achieved in that particular unit. If you wish, you can grade for each chapter. So when I'm teaching propagation of sound, I know there will be remembering. A, I would give there. For understanding, I would give B. Apply, I would give B because there is some application over there and so on and so forth. So if you want, you can give grades to objectives subject, uh, chapter wise or you can give a common uh, grading for the entire unit. So now the next aspect we move on to is the time available for teaching. Now, the most important part in your planning is that the teacher must consider the time that is available for you to teach. Okay? So, we have already seen that first you have to identify the chapters that are there, put them under suitable units. After having done that, we then look into the objectives that you will be achieving, that will be achieved as a result of teaching that particular chapter or teaching that particular now, the most important factor after this is that you have to identify the number of teaching periods that are available in your hand. Time factor is very, very important. So, what can you do is first you need to identify that if I have six periods that are allotted to me in a particular week to teach English in the standard, then if I have 36 weeks. That is teaching as well as testing, then how many periods will I have in a particular year? So let's calculate. So if I have 35 weeks to teach, and there are six periods in a week. So how many total do I have? So 35 multiplied by 6 is 6, 0, 30, uh, 30, and 18, and 19, 21. So yeah, 210 teaching periods is what I have with my fifth standard class. Now, keeping that in mind, I will spread my teaching and testing periods for all the units that I have prepared. Okay. So, when you are preparing, you are looking at your, uh, when you are preparing your units, under each unit, there will be four, five, six chapters. Like that, you might have many units and under each unit, there might be many chapters. So, you have to get equal uh Equally, you have to distribute your teaching and testing periods. So, let's look at this example. For science, only we'll continue. So, we saw sound as a unit. We saw that there, there are three chapters under this unit. These are the objectives we achieve. And then, how many testing periods can I allot to teaching this particular unit? So, for sound, the first chapter, I get eight periods. So, eight teaching periods will be allotted to the first chapter. Propagation of sound, again, another eight periods will be allotted, eight teaching periods. And electric charge, seven teaching periods will be allotted. Now that I have understood that these many teaching periods I can give to each one of these chapters, how many testing periods can I give? So that is yet another important, test, uh, important aspect. And that is you need to identify the time required for testing of the chapters that you have taught. Okay. 
So let's look at it. Testing period, I will say for sound one, for propagation of sound, I need two testing periods. For electric charge, I need two testing periods. So this makes the total five. So total teaching periods, I have 23 for this particular unit. Testing periods, I have five. In all, it works up to total number of periods I require is 28 to teach this particular unit that is of sound in the month of January. Okay. So having understood this, this is how your your time looks like. The worksheet. I have already shared the worksheet with you. You can either take a photocopy of these worksheets or you can prepare it uh, in your uh, notebook as well. The choice is yours. But it will be nice if you prepare a soft copy of this thing and you can show it to your method master. Okay. So now how are you going to go about doing this? In your year plan, you will first mention the standard, the year plan you are preparing for. Which standard year plan are you preparing? Fifth, sixth, seventh, that you will write over here. You will write the name of your subject. That is your method one. So for example, Monali, your first method is science. So you will write science over here. If you're preparing in standard five, you will write five over here. In standard five, how many total teaching periods are allotted for science? And according to that, based on the total number of teaching periods, you can identify the testing period, uh, teach, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, the total number of periods that are allotted in science. Based on that, you can identify how many periods can you give for teaching and how many uh, teaching uh, testing periods can you have. Okay, so if the total number of periods you have is say 210, then you can allot 180 or 190 for teaching and the remaining you can have for testing. Okay, so this is how your, your plan will be. It will not come in one page you might have to add more and more leaflets to it okay so when you sit in your methods you can ask your respective method teachers to help you identify the number of teaching uh, the number total number of periods that are there in a year allotted to your method to that particular standard and then you can start preparing your your plan okay so like that all methods can do it I'll show you a sample right now. I'll show you two samples, one of uh, science and one of English. So the, here we have an example of a year plan for science standard seven. So total number of teaching periods identified were 198 to teach science in seven standard class. Here the student has allotted 167 teaching periods and 31 testing periods. So let us see how the student has prepared her year plan. Definitely, two year plans cannot be the same. The way you look at a year plan will be very different from another person. So it is totally upon the teacher and how she wants to go about it. No one year plan is the perfect plan. Okay. So let's look over here. If you can I see here, we have the serial numbers being allotted. So she has given one, two, three. Uh, you have the unit name and the month. So the first month, that is June and July, the unit name that she has given is nature and all chapters related to nature she has put under nature over here. Also, she has not graded the objectives over here, but she has merely put a tick mark that these objectives will be achieved when she is going to teach these chapters under these particular units. She has very clearly written down the number of teaching periods and testing periods that are required for each chapter. If you want, you can have an overall calculation of each unit also written over here at the end. Okay. Next, she shows that in the month uh, of July, somewhere between July, she will start and she'll take it up to the complete September. So she is going to teach the unit name heat and all chapters related to heat she is preparing here. In the month of October to December, she is dealing with the theme named living things. And all chapters related to living things she's preparing here. In the month of Jack, sound, which we have already seen in detail. And Feb and March, they are dealing with food, and all chapters related to food have been prepared here. At the end, she has calculated 
that teaching periods plus testing period is equal to the total number of periods which you saw in the first slide when I showed. So she had total 197, 198 is what she had written. 167 she had teaching periods and testing periods for 31. So this calculation has to be done especially at the end of your your plan. On the last page, if you see, there is a small table box that has been made for you. You're supposed to fill it up. Okay. You might feel that in three pages your work is not done. You might want extra leaflets. So definitely you can either have more photocopies of your, your plan and attach it, or you can either handwrite it. Choice is yours. But please understand it is preferable if you have a soft copy of this game and you can share the soft copy with your method, uh, with your guiding teacher so that he or she can correct your plan and give you guidance accordingly. Okay, let's move ahead and look at yet another sample. So here we have a sample year plan for English standard six. The total number of teaching periods allotted are 216. 216 periods are allotted for teaching of English in one particular year of a standard year. So here we are given 145 teaching periods and there are 71 testing periods. Let's move, move ahead and see how we do it out. Okay, so in the month of June, we have June and July, we have all the chapters related to nature that have been added over here. So you see, we have a poem that is children are going to school. We have an autobiography of the Greek ambassador related to nature. We have the silver house, which is all about the moon. It talks about the moon. Here we have a lesson that is uh, Anna Krakatoa, which can be taught. We have adverbs. We also have nouns and kind and prefixes and suffixes. So definitely the examples that she might be dealing with over here when teaching these aspects of grammar might be related to nature. And that is how it has come. Also, if you see for each chapter, which objectives can be achieved have been marked She's definitely not needed them, but has just merely put a tick mark against that. So the choice is yours. If you grade them, it is really, really nice. She's also put the number of teaching periods that are required for each uh, lesson that she has written over here. Also the number of testing period and the total number of periods. So do you see this overall calculation that is done? So for the month of June, in order to teach nature as a unit, she would require 20 teaching periods. She would require nine testing period and a total of 29 periods to complete this entire unit. Same goes in August. She has identified the unit as bravery and all chapters related to bravery, which impart the value of bravery, have been put under this particular unit. Next September, it deals with sport and all chapters related to sport have been identified in New York. October and November. It's all about learning from the past. So all chapters related to it are put over here because there are chapters of, there are certain uh, poems that are taught which helps us to teach her the various figures of speech, like simile and metaphor that also have been highlighted over here. And finally, in the month of December, January, she teaches them information, the, the unique name is information and all chapters related to that have been identified over Feb is all about containment, so chapters are related to that are put over here. Um, Jan and Feb, both of fabric, and March is about caring for all. So this is how the chapters have been identified. Okay. You just see, uh, it's just got cut. So if you see over here, the total number of teaching periods have been calculated as, um, yeah, it is 145 teaching periods and 71 testing periods. So the total works up to 216. So that is all about English that we have seen right now. We need to understand that before you start to write down your plan, time and again, we have always told you that you need to know the content under your 
particular subject or that particular standard. You need to have a thorough knowledge of the content is there within each chapter. And then only you will be able to identify whether a particular chapter fits under a specific unit or not. And how many teaching periods and testing periods can you allow? And unless you do not have the knowledge of the content that is being taught or the content that is there in that particular chapter, you will not be able to identify as to how much time can you allot to that particular chapter. Okay. When you are preparing your year plans, please ensure that your year plan can have units anywhere between five units to maximum of 12 units. And each unit can have a maximum of seven chapters and a minimum of only two chapters. Also, when you are preparing your, your plan, please ensure that there are at least two units that you prepare, which have only two chapters under them. Okay, this I am saying for a specific reason. So please ensure that when you are preparing your, your plan, you might have 10 units, okay? And in each unit, you might want to put five chapters. Please go ahead. But two units should be such that they should have only two chapters within them. Please keep it up to two. At the most, if you cannot manage, make it three. But do not go beyond that, okay? So with that, I think that is the end of your year plan. Let's understand. That in semester three, your how to prepare the year plan is very, very important for you because it is eventually going to help you understand as to how to administer the unit test. Okay, it is of utmost importance because this carries mark. In semester three, under your paper CC4, you have an assignment of 10 marks wherein you have to prepare a blueprint and a test in a school subject that you have opted for. You can refer to your page number 75 of the handbook and this particular assignment you will prepare in your method two. In semester three, under your project based course for your internship, after you have delivered your 10 lessons, you are supposed to administer a unit test and analyze the results. Now this carries 20 marks. And this administration of test will be in your method one. Okay, so please ensure that you prepare your year plan today. After having understood this entire session, you will then be distributed under your uh, sub subject masters who are going to guide you as to how you will prepare your year plan related to your particular subject. Please understand it thoroughly okay and prepare your year plan you will give your year plan for correction to your lesson guiding teacher you are all placed under a lesson guiding teacher who corrects your lesson plan so you will give your year plan to your lesson guiding teacher however after your lectures on year plan or unit plan or blueprint you will be taking your guidance with your method master subject method master okay we'll be having guidance in method one only so far is that clear everybody so with this i think we can end the session thank you so much